I met Raina in 2016 at the National PKU Alliance um, Conference, and she did a breakout session, and it was amazing. The room was packed. People were, like, sitting in the hallway, on the floor. It was just an amazing experience. I think we all can understand and relate to the expense of low protein food, formula, and all the other costs that go along with this. So Rena has been an amazing person who has helped many patients and families navigate coverage for these things. So if I could invite Rena up to speak. How's everybody today? Enjoying your lunch? Yes. All right. Okay, so um, thank you, Danae, for that wonderful little speech about my services. And yes, I did meet Danae at the National PKU Alliance. I am the National PKU Alliance insurance coach. I've been their insurance coach for over five years, helping PKU patients get covered for all types of medical foods, including low protein foods. Um, and this is where I found Danae. And I also met um, an HCU patient. Her name is Pamela Penrose. She's also here in the, in the audience. And um, we had a very complex case. I was new to HCU, so um, I wasn't too sure of it, how it worked or what kind of diet they needed or whatnot since I was I'm more experienced with the PKU community. So by meeting Pamela Penrose and going over her certain uh, issues that she was going through, um, we were able to successfully get her covered for her uh, medical foods. Then along the way, um, HCU Network of America was born. So yay for that. <laughs> yay! <laughs> and now we have um, a, a community or a place that we all can go to. Instead of just uh, skimming around through Facebook or going to the National PKU Alliance because it's similar to HCU Classical, I guess. Now you have a spot, the HCU Network of America to go to. Yes. So um, I'm excited to, um, to um, work with them and, and anyone else that needs help with insurance reimbursement. Um, and I, I'll give you a little presentation on uh, medical food coverage and um, insurance terminology. If you have Medicare, Medicaid, um, difference between medical uh, benefits versus pharmacy benefits of how to get your services covered. Okay, now I just learned that HCU not only just needs medical foods as formula and low protein foods, but also needs vitamins. So it's like it's a three package deal here, um, which uh, I would like to uh, let you know of an experience I just witnessed. I helped a patient, one of, one of the HCU patients called from the HCU uh, Network of America and said, my daughter um, can't get covered for her hydroxocobalamin uh, vitamin B shot. And I said to her over the phone, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I'm like, uh, this is a pharmacy coverage? And she said, yes. At first I'm, I said, well, I don't really work with pharmacy coverage. You know, I'm, I really work with, um, not for like injections anyway, you know, I, I, I usually just do supplements or medical food or low protein food. And then she's like, oh, you don't help with pharmacy with uh, the um, injection, the vitamin B12? I said, you know what? Then I'm thinking in my head, I do have experience working with pharmacy, so let me give it a shot. Maybe this is a calling that I need to another now work into this area and see if I can get this covered. She said, okay. I said, let's do it. So I went into it and uh, I, uh, I, I called the pharmacy because again, that's where I thought it was from coming from as well and that's where her problem was. And pharmacy indeed said that, um, you know, this is not a covered benefit. And I went into some more questions and uh, I said, uh, how about an oral for formula, you know, an oral version of this uh, medication? And they said, um, there is no oral. Uh, available for this type of medic, uh, vitamin or medication. And fortunately, they have to take it injected in their leg and whatnot. And this poor child, she, she just kept getting bruises and bruises and bruises and bruises from injecting herself with this 
vitamin B12, which is sad. So anyhow, um, I investigated a little bit more and they said, oh, you have to jump through loops to get this covered under pharmacy. I said, okay. So I spoke to a pharmacist and uh, bottom line is, um, the pharmacist said, well, this could be a medical benefit and not a pharmacy benefit. So this way it's covered under medical and not pharmacy. I said, huh? I said, oh, and she said, yeah. I was like, okay. So she explained to me, the pharmacist, that anything that the skin is broken or pinched is considered a medical benefit. I said, okay. And she said, if this patient can get the, the shot done at the clinic, they would use a J code. It's a HCPCS code, it starts with a J. And the clinic will then bill the insurance company for that service under the J code in their clinic and boom, she's covered without having to uh, jump through loops and holes, holes with pharmacy. I said, I couldn't believe this. I usually work with B codes and S codes and now there's a J code involved with this. So anyway, it comes along with other things and, and, and um, other ways of getting certain services uh, or medical foods covered. So my, um, my goal is to make sure that I get not just your medical foods covered, not just the low protein food and the uh, formula covered, but my goal is to help you get your vitamins covered as well, okay? Because there are some vitamins that, are, that sound like a medication, you know, not something that you could go to the, uh, the pharmacy, go through the lines of the pharmacy and pick out a B6 or B12. Okay, that's what it is. I just learned today from Dr. <laughs> from Dr. Kaplan today that there's names for these different vitamins, you know, that's really not considered over the counter. Get this, you know, that there's sometimes with pharmacy benefits, formula is considered over the counter. You ever heard of that at one point in your life with formula? Under pharmacy, this is over the counter. It's not covered yet. You have to go through loops and holes to get your formula covered under pharmacy, which is typical medica medical benefit, mind you. So I'm thinking here, okay, well, if they considered a formula, which is medical food, a supplement and an OTC, which is over the counter, then this could be similar to these vitamins, which is considered over the counter and should be under the umbrella of a medical food, right? Kind of seems like it holds hands in that aspect of it. So I'm working on trying to uh, maybe get or work with some of you that have these vitamins covered under your pharmacy benefits or possibly even under your medical benefits. I've worked for many years with uh, with uh, working with medical foods and uh, formula and low protein food coverage, and it's the same method, over the counter. Now, if your primary diagnosis is HCU, and you need this supplement, which they used to call, or they still do call formula supplement, then this should be covered just the same, right? Is still under the same treatment. Get me. Let me. Let me know if I'm wrong. Um, you have a nutrition assessment, no? And under that nutrition assessment, you have uh, those three categories: the formula, the medical foods, and the vitamins. No? Okay. So if you have a letter of medical necessity that indicates in the letter from your doctor that says that you need one, two, and three in order to treat your primary diagnosis of HCU, and if untreated, it can cause seizures, tremors, whatever the case may be, submit that along with the prescription on the prescription diagnosis code. There's a chance of getting this covered. There's a chance I'm saying, this is new to me. I've done miracles before. I just started a new miracle for this little girl with the J code with the injection in her leg. So there is hope right now, right here. Think about it. Formula is considered over the counter and a supplement with pharmacy. Formula. And the supplement is considered the same, but still under the same umbrella, the diagnosis code HCU. I think it's E72.11, right? So why don't let's start working on that? Let's work together on that. 
come to the HCU Network of America and contact me and let's, let me teach you how to do it even on your own. Let's start getting your vitamins covered. I know you need that, some people may not need that, but people are paying a lot of money out of pocket for that because they think their insurance is not covering it because it's a supplement. Same way like a formula. So let's try to figure this thing out and get this covered. It's not fair. I think the best way, again, is a letter of medical necessity, indicating all of that in writing, even entering in the sole source of nutrition, having a percentage of a sole source of nutrition if you could. Sometimes these insurance companies exclude this because it needs to be the sole source of nutrition, right? So if you put a percentage in, well, in conjunction with the food, the formula, and the supplement, ask your doctor, what percentage is the sole source of nutrition with those three dietary uh, products? What is the sole source? I don't know. You have to ask your doctor. But if it's over 60%, huh, you have a great chance of getting things covered. These are some things you need to know. And you also need to know insurance terminology. Okay, the only thing that I don't know is if we can get these B vitamins or B6 vitamins covered, which I feel a little confident we could, how can we get this distributed? Now we know we all have DME companies that can provide your formula you know, and, and your low-protein food and all of that, but do we have a company that can help us distribute the product and build the insurance company for these vitamins once we know that we can get this covered? I don't know. So this is a big thing. This is huge. We need companies that will actually have this in stock so they can build the same way they would with formula. It's not fair. Here you have Corum, you have Edge Park, you have everybody with all these uh, you know, different types of formula, which is great because that's like the most important, but why not add these too? It's not just for HCU, I'm sorry, but there are comorbidities related to HCU, no? Like epilepsy, tremors, depression. It's related to the same disorder, am I right, am I wrong? It's under the same umbrella, under the same diagnosis code. So if you're not getting covered for your uh, mental condition or you're not getting covered for your epilepsy, which Solus Nutrition has a lot of good products for that, then you can get covered as long as your primary diagnosis is HCU. Okay, I know the biggest thing for you guys Okay, but then again, you do have those B, B vitamins that help prevent that, no? Okay, so, so we want to focus then on, on your, B, your, your vitamins. I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong. This is still new to me with HCU, but I see something here. I see something that's missing. We're missing a supplier that can provide these B, B vitamins or vitamin supplements and and a distributor where they could also bill to your insurance company. So in the middle, you know, I think the only way that you could possibly do this is by getting it administered every day with your clinic and let them bill it directly to your insurance company. This is what I'm thinking. But um, maybe we can find a way, find a supplier that can stock these products and get it covered under your insurance plan. But again, keep in mind, formula is still considered over the counter and can still consider it a supplement. And you still have to jump through loops and holes to get it covered under pharmacy. So why not with the, with the whole regimen and throw in the vitamins as well? That's all I, I, I just wanted to throw out that there. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you fall. Okay, I'm going to um, talk about coverage for ACU and related comorbidities, insurance terminology, difference between medical and pharmacy coverage, reimbursement issues between insurance company and supplier, billing discrepancies, verifying insurance benefits before placing an order, which is just like what Christopher you mentioned, be your own insurance advocate, right? Why not? So I'll give you some instructions on how to do that on your own. 
And uh, Medicare and Medicaid advice, state Medicaid fee schedules and reimbursement, questions and support. Okay, so I'll go through that. Okay, so again, I'm still new to HCU, so if you see anything wrong, just raise your hand <laughs> and let me know, okay? Okay, so um, I learned that there's different types of HCU, not just the classical, okay? Which is uh, the classical, the cobalamin defects, the M MTHFR, and the BHMT is something that I just learned. Any of you in the audience know about the rare diseases, the MTHFR? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Anybody uh, knows about the BHMT? Of course. Um, all right, so the comorbidities is a medical term used to describe additional diseases or disorders co uh, occurring with, that is, co or concurrent with a primary disease or disorder such as HCU. If HCU is the primary diagnosis and there are additional medical treatments required to ma maintain a person's health, that is, in relation to treating HCU, then the treatment should be covered with a prescription. All right. Uh, treatments for the primary diagnosis of HCU, the diagnosis code is an ICD, T, ICD, uh, IC10 code, which is E72.11. Keep that in mind at all times whenever you're discussing this with your insurance company. So the treatments I just learned, as you all know already, we talked about treatments with the doctor and Krista View. So um, all of this is, is a factor into your health that we need to help get this covered and find a distributor that could actually dis distribute and uh, bill your insurance company for these products. Hopefully we can find one. Okay, without knowing the proper insurance terminology and understanding your insurance coverage for medical food, dental formula can be confusing and frustrating, of course. Let's start here. What uh, is a credible coverage known as health benefit plan? Everybody has a health benefit plan, right? Um, is your policy from your employer or any other party that provides policy guidance and benefit information, including whether it's insured or self-funded? Insured, sorry. Read through your credible coverage policy for an accurate description. Yes, please read through your policy. Don't skim through it, because you may, you may find something in there that um, may help you out in the long run. If you already have coverage for your low proteins and foods and formula, then you know what I'm talking about. But and still, if it's a supplement, your vitamins fall in that category as well. So you read through that accurately and, and look for descriptions. The key words are enteral, medical foods, nutrition, and formula. Usually, of course, if, if ones that know about this, HIPAA codes for that is B4155, the B4157, usually the B codes, and now the new J code, which is J3420, and that's for the injection vitamin B12. I do not know how to pronounce that name. Up to 1,000 MCGs. This is the new code for your injections. And that, again, would need to be administered in, in, at your clinic, and the clinic would then have to um, uh, bill your insurance company at this point until we find a supplier or a distributor or what may have you that can carry that. All right, um, does anyone in, at, in here today uh, understand or ever heard of different insurance words like uh, in-network, out-of-network? Yeah, right, so you pretty much what knows what that is. So it's best to stay in network because it's more affordable, right? And out of network is, is, is a little less affordable and that uh, out of network providers can balance bill you, so you have to be careful with that. And then the other insurance words, which is, these are insurance words that I actually have to talk with when um, discussing benefits with your insurance plan, okay? This is the only way that they would understand exactly what the service is. So it's medical foods and enteral formula are the same description with different wording. Enteral formula is more towards dietary supplements and medical foods are designed for a particular medical condition. Service codes, also known as CPT or HIPAA codes. I use the word service code when I do my insurance verification. So instead of, um, I like to verify benefits for my HIPAA code, I don't know, sometimes you get these benefit specialists that have no idea what the heck you're saying. So most of the time it's just, I'd like to verify benefits for my service code. So whenever you're doing this on your own as an insurance advocate by yourself, 
You just mentioned I'd like to verify benefits for my service code, whatever the service code may be. Pre-authorization, predetermination. Pre-authorization a required process by your insurance carrier before coverage begins. The predetermination is a courtesy and helpful information towards any future denials. So when doing your own insurance coverage, even though your insurance company may not need a pre-authorization before coverage starts, you want to prevent a denial. In order to do that, you ask, can you please do a predetermination? This is optional, but it's always good to do to avoid denials. Anyway. Okay, does anyone know the difference between pre-authorization and predetermination? Yeah? She's saying, yeah. Okay, can you tell me? Oops, look, I'm tripping all over the place, sorry. <laughs> okay. I can't explain it really well. That's okay, just tell me what um, it is. Pre-authorization is asking the doctor to write a letter saying that it's a medical necessity for you to have that product, whereas predetermination, you won't need that letter. Nope, you just still you need, need the same still thing. Need, that's where I got, I'm a little okay. off. Okay, that's okay. But that's good. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so you can understand the difference, okay? So the difference is, it, there really isn't a difference when it's submitting a pre-authorization and predetermination. You see? Yeah. You see? So when you're your own insurance advocate, yes, you have insurance navigators working for other places, but when you're your own ins uh, insurance advocate, you want to completely understand what's the difference. Just keep in mind that predetermination is to avoid denials, to avoid denial. period. So even though they say you don't require prior authorization, which is good, you still want to ask if they could do a predetermination for your own benefit. Got it? Okay, good. All right, next. Okay, uh, there's fully insured plans, self-funded plans, ERISA plans, and deductibles. Uh, fully insured plan, when you pay for your own monthly premium or percentage from your employer. Self-funded plan, when your employer pays for your benefit premiums. And ERISA is an Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It is a federal law that sets minimum standards for most voluntary established pensions, union health plans, and private industries falls under self-funded plan guidelines. Deductible is the amount of money that needs to be met before your insurance pays. So th these is, this is important for you to understand because um, there are certain benefit exceptions if you have a certain plan, like fully insured, self-funded, or ERISA, just so you know. We'll get into that. Then you have an out-of-pocket max. You ever heard of an out-of-pocket max that gets you confused? It's like, wait a minute, I thought that was a deductible. Do I have to mean that too before I get coverage? No. That's just an allowance from your insurance company. That could increase your benefit from 80% to 100%, okay, covered. So there's this allowance amount that they give you, let's say $1,000, and your deductible is $1,000. Sometimes it, it includes a deductible. So if you meet your deductible and the out-of-pocket and you only have 70% coverage, you get 100% coverage for the entire year. So you may want to check that out. Well, usually they're high like maybe over 5,000 or whatnot for out-of-pocket max. But that just, that's for, that out-of-pocket max goes for your co-payments, for your prescriptions, for doctor's visits, x-rays, whatever, you know, if you hit that max, just know there's a possible chance of 100% coverage. Exclusions and allowed amounts. Um, exclusions are items or conditions that are not co covered by the general insurance contract. So we all know that there's going to be a roadblock in your insurance coverage. So that's where you, you know, you would try to figure out, okay, where's the roadblock? How can I figure this out, uh, and, and go from there. Allowed amount is just a, it's just an amount that the co uh, that the insurance company will pay you or the supplier for reimbursement. Okay, so we're back over here again. Anybody know what a, des a deductible is? Is it monies? I agree. <laughs> is it monies you deduct from your bank account, a deduction from your income tax, or an amount of money that needs to be met before your insurance? One, two, or three? three. Yes. What is the difference between pre-authorization and predetermination? Both are the same. Pre-authorization is required and predetermination is a courtesy, or all of the above? One, two, or three? Three. three. 
<laughs> High five. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Little tricky. All right. Okay. And what is a service code? Is it a description of medical services, also known as CPT or HCPCS code, or both one and two? One, two, or three? Yes. Very good. You're ready to be your own insurance advocate. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now here's the difference between medical benefits versus pharmacy benefits. Oh, boy, 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 boy. Anyway, medical benefits is uh, usually for enteral formula and your medical foods, low-protein foods, you know, um, which is B4157 or S9435. Pharmacy benefits uses an NDC number, which is usually the, it's not, it's, you, we all know it's not a drug, right? So the Centers of Food and Safety Administration creates a, um, an NDC that you could use in order for pharmacies to bill for this particular medical food product. And so it's called an NDC anyway. And they, um, they use that number, it's an 11 digit number, in order to bill for your medical foods under pharmacy. Okay, and now we have a new one. Medical benefits for hydroxyl Cobalamin ML, which uses the HCPCS code J3420. And for pharmacy benefits, it's, an un, it's under an NDC number, which is that number there, 00591-2888-30, is what they would bill for that type of vitamin. It's usually injected at the physician's office under medical. So now we know that that is, could fall under your medical benefit versus pharmacy. All right, the dietary treatment for the classical HCU requires medical foods such as formula and solid low protein foods. Um, um, I think I said that right, Omnix um, one or Hominix one, and HCU gel. The health insurance benefits for products treated for classical HCU typically fall under the medical benefit since the treatments are administered at home. There are some products covered under pharmacy benefits, but most are considered over the counter, right? And require jumping through loopholes. The dietary treatment, uh, other than classical HC, HCU, such as cobalamin defects, requires vitamin B12 injections, such as that hydroxocobalamin ML. The health insurance benefits for uh, this product for cobalamin defects typically fall under the medical benefits, as we just learned. Since the skin is pinched or broken, such as an injection, and the place of service, such as the clinic, if your clinic could purchase these products, administer, and bill your insurance company, it would be the best affordable route. Some pharmacy benefits does not cover these products and considered over the counter. To obtain coverage, it requires jumping through loopholes. Other possible suppliers are compounding pharmacy, specialty pharmacies, or home infusion. Trying to get covered under your pharmacy benefit? Depending on your policy, your medical food could be covered under pharmacy and medical. The best route is to choose the most affordable. If you uh, not have coverage under pharmacy, check your plan if it's fully insured. If so, your plan must abide by the state mandate and grant coverage. State plans should have verbias for pharmacy or any other health group plan. You have to read the, through that as well. All right, so let's, how to, let's get it covered under pharmacy, and this is how you can do it. Steps to cover under pharmacy. Number one. And if you don't have it, that's fine. You can obtain a copy of your state's pl um, state plan's mandate. Okay, um, the National PKU Alliance has a map of all the state mandates that includes HCU in it, some of them. So if you're looking for your state, the best way to go is to go there, to nationalpkualliance.org. Check your state and see if that, that you could find your state mandate there. Then submit an authorization to pharmacy, this is the loops that you have to go through. Then submit an authorization to pharmacy management along with the state mandate, if you have it, a prescription, letter of medical necessity, and clinical notes, all of that. Th third, first, the first attempt will get denied. You will get denied, period. Don't worry, you know it, we all know it, you will get denied, wait for the denial. Then, after you get the denial, then you submit it to the appeals department along with the cover letter, appealing denial with description, state mandate, prescription letter, medical necessity, and clinical notes. If denied again, you have three attempts to appeal and check your plan. 
Okay. The appeals department, uh, through your medical, makes the final decision with coverage under your pharmacy. So overall, who makes the final decision for your pharmacy benefit? Your medical. So you have to jump through these loops here in order for you to get covered under pharmacy coverage. We try this even for your vitamins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, how long does it what take? The entire process? Well, um, I usually mark mine as urgent, so I make sure that it's, um, it's taken care of within um, 24 to 48 hours. If you don't mark it as urgent, then you could wait at least up to 30 days. So my trick is I mark my prioritization as urgent, okay, to get it done as quickly as possible. Let's get this appeal going. And I do the same thing with the appeal. I mark that as urgent so they can review it quicker. And it is urgent. You need your food. You can't sit there and wait 30 days for approval. So there's a trick. That's the trick. You're welcome. I'm sorry? How do you mark them as urgent? Okay, when you're submitting to them, you, uh, you ask them, I'd like, to, I, I'd like to place this as an urgent okay. process. Because she That's told it. me 30 to 60 days is That's the norm, take. yeah, get around the norm. It's and it urgent, it's uh, 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. And it, yep. it didn't do 30 to 60 days for each attempt because I got three denials. You got three denials and or you... Yeah, three denials before we ended up with the court. And you never did the urgent? No. Everybody, this is Tara Hummel. And then I called you in panic. <laughs> and uh, she can explain to you a situation that I actually helped. This is one of my patients. Go ahead. Explain I a little bit. Um, oh, so, I mean, literally, it was um, denial after yeah. denial. And you literally have to go through the process. Like she was saying, you can't, you can't skip them. Um, and you only write letters. And you can't show up at the front doorstep. They won't even tell you where they're located, <laughs> apparently, for security <laughs> issues. But, um, because <laughs> I'm <I've> threatened. <laughs> and, you know, you, you pray to find someone like Raynette who understands and is compassionate. I actually found some customer service rep in Las Vegas who was a mom and could, I'm, I'm like, I'm crying on the phone. I'm like, my baby doesn't have this formula. But um, in the, the one case Raynette's talking about, we had the wrong code. I'm fighting this thing and I'm assuming I'm getting the right code from my dietitian and my medical providers and I didn't know these codes the wrong and code. so what kind of code did you have we had the wrong uh, we had the it wasn't a J code because I use J no, codes for my code. infusions there's a B code. B code yeah and it was coded wrong so they were denying and they were supposed to be denying but I didn't realize numbers were wrong and wow. what triggered it then um, it was a coding issue right it was just a it was, um, oh no, it was a diagnosis Mm -hmm. It was a diagnosis code okay. that was entered wrong into the system at my medical provider at a, at a hospital facility that it was entered wrong and this was going to them and they're saying we deny it. This, the diagnosis is not Horrible. covered. And I'm like, I, and I was able to help her clear everything up <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day. With two emails. <laughs> with just two emails and she was fighting for a year. And just it so you know. Yeah. So okay. I mean, it's, just, it's a process. And, and tough to know. Like, I love the fact that you're going through this. I do this part in my job for infusions, and I still don't understand it, but. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. We have, um. Just a quick question. There must yeah. be such a variety from state to state. Yes. Is there just any, like, top five states you say just don't live there because it's so horrible or what? Never. <laughs> I don't take no for an answer ever. So, no. Okay. The only thing I can say is with. It's a huge variability, right? Yes. Oh, yes. There's all different ways that you would never know that it would be actually sitting there. Right. Yep. Here's uh, Pamela Penrose. If you want to stand up. Hello. Pamela <laughs> is my first HCU patient that I worked for, um, helping her with her medical food coverage. And right before I met with Danae, and Danae, she learned, I, I guess I, Danae learned me from you or right. whatever. It was a chain reaction. So, um, she had some issues with her insurance plan. I think it was mostly because she had Medicare. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was um, the new one, <laughs> unfortunately, okay. or the way it was. But I think, I don't know. Do you, that, that's right, yeah. 
So she was having issues getting covered under pharmacy benefit, and all along it was a covered under medical. And uh, Pamela's. And, and also, I was initially ordering my formula di directly from the company. And then um, Raynette was the one who suggested, I think we need to get you hooked up with a pharmacy vend uh, not, uh, with a medical food ben vendor. And once I did that, I've never had any more problems. So <laughs> it's been wonderful. It was a complex case, just so you know. It was a little longer than that. But you know, there are ways of working around it and helping people that just don't understand. This mm -hmm. is why we're here as a community, help each other. We were also on a self-funded plan, which sometimes can uh, Call, cause a few problems too, and but we've got it that. all straightened out. Yeah, we got it all straightened <laughs> out. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> okay. All right. So those are some things that uh, you could hear from your, uh, for, for yourself of, of how this helps and how you know I can help you and how we can help each other and just be your own insurance advocate or whatever it is. Okay. Do you really want a fun quiz? Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What benefit plan does a HCPCS code uh, apply? Dental, medical, vision. One, two, three? Yeah. yeah, okay. What benefit plan does NDC code apply? DME, pharmacy, home infusion? Yes. What uh, department makes the final prior authorization decisions? Utilization, prior authorization management department, pharmacy management department, appeals department. One, two, three? Yes. Okay, so um, how much longer do I have? Let's see here. Okay. I'll try to skim through this as quickly as possible. Um, as we all know, receiving uh, reimbursement issues between insurance company and supplier. Sometimes you can get a bill from your supplier, everything's covered, right? But you get a bill now from your supplier that says you owe all this money. And you're like, what the heck? It's covered under my insurance plan. Even Raynette helped me, right? So we, we get a bill and all of a sudden it's just, what, what, what is this? So it could be confusing because uh, is it a bill or is it just your explanation of benefits? So you wanna make sure that it's not a bill and you, it's your explanation of benefits and it's just an itemized statement that's telling you what's covered and what's not, okay? So don't get confused with that. Um, you will receive an EOB after your provider submits a bill or claim to your insurance. If you don't receive your EOB, request one from your insurance carrier or you can go on, online and get one. If you receive uh, an EOB and notice there's a balance due, it could be that you haven't met your annual deductible, so don't panic and we'll need to pay for your formula up front until your deductible's met. Contact your insurance carrier to confirm if your deductible's met, or it could be just your coinsurance. If you met your deductible or you don't have a deductible on your plan, contact your supplier, go over your EOB. Um, it's best to work it out with your supplier to avoid any future bills and help alleviate possible frustration. Also participating, uh, suppliers must not balance bill your customers, just know that, so if you ever get a bill, and your a plan is participating from a supplier, that's completely wrong. You should never get a bill from anybody uh, if, if this company participates, only if they're out of network. If you notice your balance due is unusually high, contact your supplier and ask to go through the claims, your invoices that were sent to your insurance carriers. So what's a billing discrepancy? You'll hear this. It's a cost versus reimbursement problem between your supplier and your insurance company. Supplier companies are responsible for billing customers, insurance carriers. If not done correctly, the supplier can get confused and send a bill to you for non-covered services. First, it always depends on the person's working on the claim from the supplier's billing department. Lots of these people need to be educated. Suppliers insurance verification should be done first before providing the customer products. If verified as covered and you still get a bill, then there is a communication problem between the person working on the claim and the insurance company. Okay. Once verified as covered, the suppliers need to fight with your insurance. Okay, so these are more like billing discrepancies as far as if you get uh, a bill uh, from your supplier and you notice something unusually high, there's an issue here, find out why. Sometimes the supplier, like Quorum and Edge Park, have these um, insurance benefit departments and they sometimes incorrectly bill your claim, just so you know. So you need to contact them to make sure that they bill your claim correctly. Sometimes they're not using the appropriate HIP, uh, diagnosis code. There's many, di um, um, di no, I'm sorry, HICPICS code. There's many different HICPICS code, service codes, B4157, B4155, B4, it really depends on which service that they're um, billing. And if it's a state mandate plan, if there's exclusion as a state mandate plan, that needs to be implemented correctly in the claim. A lot of times these um, insurance um, uh, companies well, that have insurance advocates within suppliers, 
they tend to bill your claim incorrectly and all of a sudden you're hit, you're hit with a bill. So whenever you see something that's unusually different or you have a high balance, contact your supplier and find out what's going on with, um, with submitting the claim. Okay, complaints with insurance. You have the right to complain, as you know, if you have any issues with your insurance plan. Uh, finding health insurance carriers. If you decide to opt out of your current health insurance carrier, add a secondary insurance carrier. Um, you can find a different or secondary insurance carriers at healthcare.gov or ehealthinsurance.com. So say, for instance, if you only have one, um, one insurance provider and um, it's not covering enough, and you can, uh, if you can afford it, get another one as a secondary to pick up what the primary won't cover. And if you have Medicaid, of course, that's the secondary as always, all the time. And complaints, you have an, uh, if you have an exclusion on your plan, don't take no for an answer. Never take no for an answer. There's always possibilities everywhere. Um, one way or another, upside or downside, there's a way to get things covered. Contact your health plan and ask to file a complaint against coverage for your medical food. If you have a fully insured plan, find your state mandate to remove the exclusion and submit to your insurance carrier. Now, if you have a self-funded plan, um, don't be scared as well, uh, because uh, if, if you have a self-funded plan, self-funded plans do not have to abide by state mandates. Do not, they do not have to abide. But why not ask them if they honor it? So I had some, um, I had some um, customers that they do indeed honor the state mandate covered even though it's a self-funded plan. So you have to ask before just thinking, oh, it's not covered, it's self-funded. Self just ask, do you, can, do you honor the state mandate, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, even though? And let's say that you have a plan, um, your pl you live in uh, Illinois, but your plan is contracted in North Carolina. So that state mandate would have to be applied to your contracted insurance plan. So you would have to use the state mandate for North Carolina, not where you live, just so you know. Okay. And we can also help you with medical food exclusion removers, removals. If that doesn't help, then you know, uh, we'll submit a medical food exclusion removal letter. And we'll help you um, remove any type of medical food exclusions. Any questions? I'm sorry, I only have 15 minutes, so I was rushing. <laughs> Oh yes, and there's some more information here that you can verify placing benefits um, on your own. I gave instructions how to do uh, be your personal advocate, so um, I'm sure this will be on the website. You can go ahead and, and use this as being your personal, be your own insurance advocate, right? So here's some some information how to go about that, and some more information about Medicaid and Medicare. So I live in DC, which means I know some of these things. Um, there's gonna be a, a Medical Food Act that's getting dropped in Congress if it hasn't done already. Just to be aware, I think they're having a hearing at the beginning of June about this, but write your congressmen and your senators. This act has been dropped before. It was dropped last year and was dropped the year before and got no traction, wasn't entertained in committee. There is certainly much more interest in the Congress to entertain it in committee and push it actually to the floor this year. So if you have medical foods, there is in fact an act that's been worked on very hard to get coverage for medical foods and formulas. Being dropped in Congress, write your senator, write your congressman, tell them your story. Because I, go I can go to the floor and talk to congressmen and senators and who they really care about is talking to you, the patients. So if you can tell a story or something like that that really personalized it. For those of you with younger children, you can send a picture that your children drew. You know, all those kinds of things brings this to life. Thanks, Kim. And we'll also post um, on the Facebook site and our website, give you some template of like language you could use, but it is really important to advocate for that. Thank you, you had your hand? Oh, you can ask for the language that they want as well. Yeah, the medical foods, ec food, <laughs> medical nutrition equity act. And so we'll, I think uh, Danae posted something before, but we'll post it again and make sure it's on our website. See, I had a question earlier also, um, as I was talking to you. Uh, my son 
uh, has had seizures. Uh, that's how he, was, he got diagnosed with homocystinuria. But uh, the seizure medications have been like the copay has been increasing the, over the years. So he was paying like a fifty dollars for a, uh, I mean like one time for ninety days supply to now he's paying like five hundred and eighty five dollars for the same medication. So it's just that then the betaine it's the same thing. So how do you approach um, getting coverage, proper coverage? I mean like. $50 to $585 every three months we have to pay for his medication. That's only one medication. He's on several. So it's just that medical food and the products for the low protein treat, I mean for the treatment of HCU. What about the other things that are connected because of the HCU? Which is usually co comorbidities is what, we, or what I was trying to um, teach earlier in, within my, pro uh, my presentation. And um, Margie mentioned that most of these, most of those types of medications are already covered under pharmacy. But if you're in, uh, if you're in experiencing um, problems getting covered for these medications, then that's an issue. Uh, is it a percentage copay? So, are they charging you that amount of money? So let me explain a little bit about pharmacy benefits because I um, I worked for the pharmaceutical industry and ran the managed care plan for or, or business for a while. The way a pharmacy benefit works is they will tell you which drugs they cover and they will usually have them in tiers, whereas generic drugs are usually the you know tier one. Then uh, branded products, tier two, are those they consider most cost effective. And then they often have tier three, which they consider less cost effective. And then they now, many plans have added what's called a specialty tier for higher priced oncology drugs, injectable drugs, et cetera. Historically, there was always a dollar copay. So I was working in my father's pharmacy in the 1980s, and the Blue Cross card, a Blue Cross plan, this was in New York State, had a $3 copay for everything. Well, things have changed since like the early 80s, and it went from having $3 to everything to having a different mom, maybe it was 10, 15, 20, 30, based upon those four tiers. But over time, the, the payers, and it's really driven, while we all hate the insurance companies, their customer are the employers or the unions or the school system who's ever providing the benefit. Over time, those payers said, hey, costs are going up way too much, I can't afford this. What are my options for bringing the cost down? And the percentage copay was introduced as a way to say, well, okay, if this drug costs $1,000 per month, the person should pay 20% of that or $200, whereas if this other drug costs you know, $100 a month, then they pay only $20. And they did that as a way to offset the costs. The same reason why the, you know, your own premium, if you work for a, a company or another organization that gives you medical benefit, the same way that over time, how much you have to pay in has gone up as well. So the percentage copay both helps defray the cost, but the payer is also trying to introduce some price sensitivity as opposed to people saying, yeah, I'm just gonna get this drug, oh, it's costing someone else $10,000. They want you to think about, is it really worth it? And so it's unfortunate because those that are hurt the most are those with serious illnesses that, that have high cost medications needed to treat them. And so um, perhaps I think uh, Recordati is here who makes Cystidane. Is anyone in the room from Recordati? Because the companies often know, if, if one of you want to add on to my answer, the companies often know, are there ways to offset that percentage copay? For a lot of the rare disease drugs that are out there today, uh, companies have what's called a copay assistance program. So California doesn't allow that. But for other, other medications, and if we're lucky enough to get new, treat, new drug treatments approved and on the market for homocystinuria, hopefully the percentage copays can be offset by a copay uh, reimbursement or support program, except California. So that question about are there states where you should not live? California, I love California, <laughs> but there are other reasons. Yeah, now they, and one of the reasons the state governments and others don't like it is because you're taking away that price sensitivity from the consumer 
And so, the, you know, they're saying, oh, sure, the company's going to pick up the copay, which might be 20% of the bill, but we, you know, have to pay the other 80%. So um, states pay a lot of these costs, like they co-share the Medicaid, Medicaid costs. But let me ask if anyone from Recordati knows of any available support programs to help with the um, copay of Cystidane. One of you raise your hand, or uh, if there's... If there's nothing to say, then. Hello. So for assisted aid, there is a copay assistance program if you have commercial insurance. So that's insurance that's not Medicare or Medicaid. Um, if you have Medicare or Medicaid, pharmaceutical companies cannot um, contribute to copay assistance um, due to government regulations. If you do have Medicare or Medicaid for your insurance, you can always call Inova RX. They're the, the specialty pharmacy that um, dispenses cystadine, and they can work with you to figure out alternate sources of funding, because sometimes there's other organizations um, that can help out with that, besides the pharmaceutical companies directly. Um, oh, just call Inovo, Inovo RX, our um, specialty pharmacy, and they should be able to help you with that. Private, and they can help with, if you have government insurance, they can um, do some research and figure out if there's alternate funding sources that are available. Nord. Nord has resources as well on their website. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Renette, we didn't want to make you go through like eight slides in 10 seconds. Do you want to <laughs> just take a few more minutes to finish your slides? Uh, Again, it's uh, how I mentioned it. Um, first off, the I would like to comment on Dr. Chapman's um, can you, response. Is the mic working? Yes. Can you hear me? No? Is the mic working, Emmanuel? No. Can you back up? Um, basically, this is just some information for yourself that you could use once it's posted. So you'll uh, be a little familiar how things work between pharmacy and medical benefits for your foods your formula, and your vitamins. If you have the comorbidities related to separate medications to epilepsies and seizures, that's something uh, a little different, as um, Margie had mentioned. It's mostly under the pharmacy benefit. However, um, the Medical Food Nutrition Equity Act, you know, they're always a, a battle with that. There's always something, always a problem, of course. But I just wanted to add that I don't want anyone to be afraid that just because if, if the government decides to shut anything down, you know, you still, you're still capable of having your own insurance plan. And you, each insurance plan has their own policies. Some follow the state's mandates, some follow doesn't, some, you know, it really depends. So um, I think if anything drastic ha would happen to, to the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, that we're together to hold each other's hands when it comes to food, med nutrition coverage, Okay, because it's, it's an act. It's an act like a state, like anything else um, that's in place. But I just don't want people to get scared about it falling through the loops because each, each, each insurance plan has their own policies in place. They have their own little policies in place. And with your contracted employers, if you're working, they have their own contract in place with their, um, with their insurance company, including their insurance adjuster. So there are some, there could be some ways to help yourself out if something drastic could happen when they just stop the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. I'm just saying this is because from working with people over six years with medical food coverage in Georgia Medicaid, as we have a Georgia couple over here, how difficult is it for Georgia? Horrible, the Medicaid. And so um, just working with government offices and, and just talking with them and explaining what medical food is, and they're saying, oh, that's our SNAP program. It's not a SNAP program. It's not a food stamp, um, f you know, food benefit program. This is a medical food. This is not something on that type of program. So the language and whatnot, I feel that it's very confusing to a lot of um, different areas in the political world. But um, if we can all just hold each other's hand, I guess, and just try to help each other out the best way we can. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that we do have a webinar planned with Rena, and she'll be able to probably go into a little bit more depth with the areas that she wasn't able to cover. 
Um, that is the end of May. I, it's a Wednesday in May, and I think it's May 23rd or 24th. I don't have the date right offhand. And to contact her, um, her information is on our website. Um, it's under the resources tab, insurance or medical coverage, one of the two. It's in there, though. Or you can email me directly, and I can forward you her contact information. Um, I'm just going to scroll through her slides to get to. Oh, there we go. So here's her contact information. I'll leave that up here for a second. 